Next up is Megan Huckstrasser. Megan is a CRISPR expert and a science communicator with a passion for making complicated scientific top topics accessible to everyone, even me. Dr. Hochstrasser received her PhD from Jennifer Doudna's lab at UC Berkeley, where she studied natural CRISPR systems. Jennifer Doudna is Hilo's most famous daughter since she received the Nobel Prize in chemistry recently for her role in discovering CRISPR. For Megan, upon completing her PhD, she was recruited by the Innovative Genomics Institute to lead their communications, education, and outreach programs. Recently, Megan was recruited to become the lead editor at Arcadia Science, a startup working to advance open science and rethink research communication. Megan. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I think I'll just do a little point when I want to advance, <laughs> yeah. if that works. Um, so thanks for having me. And as Jim said, it's really appropriate to be in Hilo talking about CRISPR since uh, one of its co-developers grew up here. Um, so today I'm going to talk to talk to you about CRISPR technology, which is a way of editing DNA in living cells and organisms. And because I'm told not everyone here is a biologist or even a scientist by training, I thought I would start with some basic terminology that I might use to hopefully not confuse you too much. So I wanted to first define a genome, since if you're editing a genome, it's useful to know what a genome is. And a genome is just all the DNA inside of a cell or, or an organism. So for example, we have the human genome. That's the sequence of all of our DNA. Um, and then every living organism has DNA as well, like the apple has a genome uh, shown in this example. And so if we kind of zoom in closer, we can unpack, um, if we look at you know, the molecular details of DNA, it's organized into chromosomes, which are these X shapes. But if we zoom in further, you'll see this more potentially recognizable double helix shape. Um, and within DNA, there are these stretches of instructions called genes. So a gene gets copied into RNA, which we don't have to get into in great detail. Um, but it basically is the instruction manual for a protein. And a protein is like a little molecular machine that does a job within a cell or an organism. And so proteins are what do all these little jobs in our cells, and they end up causing us um, and various organisms to have traits. So traits are just characteristics of living things. And in the example of an apple, a, a trait of an apple might be high yield or a flavor. Um, and in, in this example, I'm going to show you, you know, if we just sort of condense this and think more um, simply about the connection between genes and traits. If we were to look at a trait in apples, for example, um, when you bite into an apple and leave it out for a little bit, it might turn brown because of a, an, a reaction called oxidation. Um, but we know some of the genes that are involved in, in making that trait happen and doing that oxidation reaction. So with a technique like genome editing or gene editing, we can change the sequence of that gene or stop it from functioning and end up making the, the trait of the apple change uh, from browning to non-browning. So that's just one example um, of how gene editing can be used and using some of the terminology. So hopefully that's somewhat clear as an intro. So what exactly is CRISPR and how does genome editing work? It's not a, a green flash that we just magically apply, right? So I want to talk about CRISPR in the context of other breeding technologies because to me it's sort of just the latest evolution of what we can do. So if we imagine a stretch of DNA, a gene in a genome as a sentence, um, you could take this starting genome, and maybe it has something you don't like, uh, like twinkle, twinkle, whittle star. We might not like the trait that this sequence confers. We might prefer the trait uh, that's caused by the word little. So if we want to change this, 
Historically, you could try to do this through selective breeding. So that's like the most traditional approach. Um, and in this case, if you look at what's happening at the DNA level, you're essentially making a, a whole bunch of changes, not quite random, but a lot of changes are gonna happen to the DNA. And maybe if you've crossed enough um, plants or whatever uh, uh, organism this is together, you'll get at least that one change that you wanted, and you find the plant that has the trait you want, but it's also gonna carry with it a bunch of other changes in the DNA, and that might not matter, or that might bring other traits that aren't as useful. So selective breeding is, is the approach that's given us things like corn, which was um, domesticated from a grass over the course of several thousand years. So it can be slow, it's a little, a little faster these days, um, but still slow. Uh, more recently, in the past maybe 100 years or so, we've gotten uh, technologies to mutagenize or kind of randomly change DNA, which can be a lot faster, but are also causing random changes. So you're again probably gonna, in, in doing this to many, many organisms, you'll get one that has the trait that you want and the sequence that you want, but it's also gonna have other changes throughout the genome. And just as an example of a product of mutation breeding, the ruby red grapefruit was made this way. And there are a variety of um, food products that we, we consume today that were generated this way. In the past couple decades, we've gotten uh, another uh, starting to be a more sophisticated technology, which is transgenesis, or the technology that gives us GMOs, or ge genetically modified organisms. So in this case, we're finally getting a little bit more control and we're able to add random, sorry, we're able to insert a piece of foreign DNA into a random site within uh, the genome of our organism. And so in this example, we know we want that little uh, sequence, but it just gets added somewhere. It doesn't necessarily get added at the site that we want that's difficult to control. And so this can be very useful if you're adding um, something like a pest resistance. So this is a, a very well-known example of, of GMOs, is a, the BT products, including corn, um, in which the, the one on the left is resistant because it has this BT gene, and then on the right it's, it's um, susceptible to a pathogen. And so finally, genome editing, um, one approach of which is, is CRISPR, finally lets us make much more targeted changes. So in addition to making a specific change that is not just a, an addition, it could be an addition, a deletion, a change of one, one letter, um, we can actually target where that happens. So it's not happening wherever in the genome, it's happening exactly where we're pointing, pointing to in the genome. And so in this example, we can finally get this uh, precise edit that we're looking for and just change that one letter. And so just one example, which I'll, I'll talk more about, or I'll, I'll give other examples of this, would be this non-browning uh, white button mushroom. So this, in theory, could reduce food waste. I don't think it's available as a product yet, um, but it could prevent people from throwing mushrooms away really early just because they've gotten a little bit brown. Okay, so how does CRISPR actually work? I'll go briefly into the details, um, and if this is not your thing, we'll leave molecular land soon, so don't worry. Um, so I'm showing you uh, the, the most famous and well-used CRISPR protein, which is called CRISPR-associated protein 9, or Cas9. And this was all the work, understanding how this works is what got Jennifer the Nobel Prize. Um, and so she figured out that we could use this protein, which actually comes from bacteria, and program it with this piece of RNA that it's carrying. Um, it's a little bit hard to see here but it's carrying around a piece of code in the form of RNA that we decide uh, to give it. So we determine what sequence we hand, it, hand off to Cas9, and then it uses that RNA kind of like a GPS finder or zip code or something to tell it where in the genome to go. So it'll look around all the DNA until it finds DNA that matches the sequence of its RNA. So this is a, a DNA finder protein, basically. And what Cas9 does generally, once it finds its target, it makes a cut through both strands, which is called a double strand break. So you're basically slicing through the DNA. And you might wonder, okay, why is cutting DNA going to make a precise change in DNA? Um, the first step is the targeting. The second step, which is the most important, is the repair, 
So cells can do two different general categories of repair here. So when you make a cut in DNA, cells sort of freak out because DNA damage is, is bad and sometimes lethal for the cell. So in this first approach, um, they will, the cell has these repair proteins that will notice that there's a break and kind of desperately seal it. So they'll, they might add in a few extra DNA letters like is shown here, which results in a small addition. Um, or they might kind of chunk a bunch out and slap the ends together and seal it off and delete some of the sequence that was there. And so this is kind of, uh, might seem damaging and bad, uh, but it can be useful because it ends up uh, blocking the function of a gene. So if we have a gene that we, we don't understand in an organism, we don't really know what it does, this is a really useful thing to try in the lab to see what happens to the organism afterward. Because if you break something and then see what happens, you can learn a lot about what that gene was doing. And there's also uses of this um, in agricultural engineering as well, like the apple browning example. If you knock out one of the genes involved in oxidations or stop it from working, you can stop the browning eff effect. So the other pathway, which in a lot of cases is more desirable, but actually very difficult to do in plants right now because of the repair systems that they have. Um, in this pathway, we, the, the scientists, add a piece of DNA or a sequence that we want inserted at that cut site. So rather than just making a cut and sealing it up and screwing up the sequence that was there, we can have the cell paste in a new sequence um, an insertion of donor DNA or replace something that was there. And so this is really useful, especially in like health applications um, because people are trying to use CRISPR to treat genetic diseases um, because you can potentially swap out mutations that are causing people harm. Um, and there's a lot of uses for this, of course, in agriculture as well, but some difficulties technically. So I have a quick little video I'll show just to sh put all of this together, and then we'll move on to what we can do with genome editing. So we're showing a cell here, and we're gonna zoom all the way into the nucleus where all the DNA lives and is stored. And you'll see Cas9 here in purple. There's a couple of them sort of searching around the DNA, looking for the precise target. And this next one will actually find its target. And without getting into too much detail, the, the way this works is it actually unwinds the two strands of the DNA double helix, and the RNA base pairs are kind of zips up with that target. So once it finds its match, it's gonna make a cut through both strands, and then here's the repair protein coming in to fix the damage. And in this case, the repair protein is, has filled in these two magenta DNA letters. And so this is probably gonna disrupt this gene and, and block it from working. So that's the gist of how that works. Um, but I know a lot of people, you know, that's a lot of information. So I think the important takeaway of this section is just that CRISPR lets us change DNA in living cells and organisms. Okay, so why, why would we want to change DNA? What might we want to do in agriculture using a tool like this? There are a lot of different applications that I, I can't explain all of them, but I thought I would just show a few examples here, and then I'll go through um, some more concrete examples in specific crops as well. Um, so these, these range from really, you know, just doing basic research to understand plant biology, um, making crops that can withstand potentially climate-induced stresses like heat or drought, um, disease-resistant crops, commercial qualities, better nutrition. There's, there's all sorts of things you can potentially do. And people are working on all of these. And just to kind of hammer home the point that this is a really useful technology, um, first I'll say that you know, this was discovered probably less than 10 years ago and has already become like a very common tool in labs all around the world. It's just a standard approach that gets used very, very often. Um, and there's definitely a lot of excitement around using it in agriculture. And I found this one document um, that's a little bit older now, but they are trying to estimate what kind of economic impact this might have, I, I believe, for investors or people interested in this space. And they, they, they give these pretty high estimates of you know, the billions of dollars that might grow in the livestock, crop, and aquaculture markets as a result of CRISPR. 
um, by 2025. So I'm not sure how close we are to that at this point. Um, but I think even though these numbers are probably kind of hand wavy, it still impresses the point that there's a lot that can be gained here. Because CRISPR is not only more precise, it's usually faster and a lot cheaper than some other approaches. And then I thought I would talk specifically about the Hawaiian bioeconomy as well and go through some Hawaiian crops as examples. And so I looked up this one source had these numbers. Again, I don't know how accurate they are, but I think it can give you a, an okay sense of, or give me an okay sense of what are the, the more important um, industries here. And when I looked up this list initially, I was kind of struck because as I was, I was going through it mentally, I was like, oh yeah, well, CRISPR has been used to edit almost all of these things already, at least in a proof of concept way. And so there's a lot that can be done potentially um, by applying it in these, these different um, organisms. And so I'll just go through a couple of examples, kind of in order. Um, so I'll start with cattle and calves. So this is an animal application, of course. Um, and in this case, uh, the most probably well-known example of genome editing in cattle is for the purpose of animal welfare, which I think is kind of an under-discussed trait or, or area that we might think about in agriculture. And in this case, um, the scientists involved in these studies were trying to make dairy cattle that wouldn't grow horns. So cattle have their horns removed early on when they're calves, and it can be a really kind of torturous, awful process. But there are cattle around the world that naturally don't have horns. And so by adding this gene that made the cattle naturally not have horns into this other, into these dairy cattle breeds, they were able to make cattle that just never grew horns, so they never had to be removed later. My next example is coffee, um, and in this case, there's a lot of potential to use genome editing to make consumer-facing traits. So rather than things that only the farmer or the developer sees, um, I think it may be important in, in getting acceptance of some of these crops and products um, if it's for the traits to be something consumers can understand, so something that would make them attracted to a product and understand why you might want to use technologies like this, even if they're not super comfortable with it, which is a whole other topic. Um, but in this example, I wanted to point out a company that I believe is based in the UK um, that is trying to make naturally decaffeinated coffee beans. So the decaffeination process right now uh, involves, I think, like heating the beans in water and having the, the caffeine seep out, which can change the nutritional um, profile, the taste, all sorts of properties of the bean, and you know uses up water and, and can be inefficient. So if you could just knock out the genes involved in making caffeine to begin with, you could potentially have just naturally decaffeinated beans. Um, I think this is my second to last example of, of edited crops and the reasons we might want to, to edit them. And I think bananas are a great example. They've come up a, a few times already in prior talks. And they're a great example of trying to get disease resistance in, in a crop. So bananas are super susceptible to a, a bunch of different diseases and pathogens, especially the Cavendish banana, which is prone to this uh, fungal infection that's threatening to wipe it out. And so I think we have an opportunity here to use technologies like CRISPR to maybe work a little bit faster and potentially do what GM technology did for the papaya and keep the Cavendish from getting wiped out. And so there's been some progress in this, um, in developing resistance to a variety of different diseases. I think all of these products are still kind of at the field testing stage where they're, they've been done in the lab, you know, the edits have been made, but they haven't been really tested in, in full environmental conditions, but fingers crossed. And then last, I wanted to bring up macadamia nuts because these were kind of notably the only organism that had not been edited yet in that list. And I think it's a, a useful example to run through some of the limitations of genome editing and where it's not so easy to apply. So one of the main reasons um, that people might struggle to use this technique in an organism is not having a, a good genome sequence. So if you don't know the sequence of DNA, you can't really design an experiment to change that sequence, right? Because you, you're going in kind of blind. 
Um, and so there's a, a lack of genome, complete genome sequences, I would say, in general in plants. Um, and this is because of the nature of plants. A lot of them have tons of chromosomes, and it's really complicated. Um, but I think the more we progress on this front, the more we'll be able to do in, in terms of genetic engineering. And specifically in macadamia nuts, um, this was kind of mentioned earlier, but there weren't great genomes um, with full annotation and everything. I just found this one example that came out like just in 2020. So I think a lot of the information about macadamia genome is newer. And next there'll be just things specific to crops, like a tree takes a long time to grow. And if you're doing a, a graduate work and doing your PhD, it's like five or six years at least, and I can't imagine having to wait five years to see if my experiment worked by the time a tree made a nut. So I think it'll be it's just slow going for some crops when they have a slow generation time. And then briefly, I won't get into this in much detail, but um, another huge limitation is just the, the ability to deliver gene editing tools like CRISPR. And this is a limitation for other techniques as well, like GM technologies. So the crop you're working in needs to have a delivery system already. And right now, that basically means usually using either a bacterium to kind of add in DNA or a gene gun, which is a bombardment where you kind of blast in DNA to, to manipulate the plant. Um, and then once you do this, generally you have to regenerate these little bits, pieces of plants. Um, into a full-on plant using a process called tissue culture and regeneration. Um, and you know, you, it takes a while to go from these little blobs called calli all the way to a full-on plant. So this whole process is just kind of slow and doesn't work super well for every different um, cultivar of every plant you might want to be working with. And so if you can't get past this step, it's hard to apply gene editing. Um, but beyond that, I think one of the most useful things about something like CRISPR is that it, it has worked in every organism where people have been able to give it a, a real try so far. Um, the limitations, as I said, are not with the CRISPR technology itself. And so it's actually been used in hundreds of different organisms, not just plants and animals, but you know, insects, um, bacteria, fungi, all kinds of things. All of the things you're seeing on the screen have been edited with CRISPR. And there's a lot more traits we might want to develop um, in addition to those that I highlighted here, um, from reducing food waste to raising yields, saving costs, um, potentially making crops that are resilient to climate change, um, or even crops that help sequester carbon better and potentially reverse or mitigate climate change. Okay, so where do we stand? So this is all kind of what we can do, what could be done, what has actually been done. So there's a few products that have just recently come out that I wanted to mention. The only commercially available edited crop that I'm aware of, um, though I suspect DuPont may have released something and just not said anything, is this uh, edited tomato. So there's a, a company in Japan, I believe, that edited this tomato to have a higher concentration of this thing called GABA. Um, which they say is linked to like lower blood pressure and heart health. I think the science is a little shaky on that connection. Um, but it is something that they made and released into the world. So that exists. You can now, I guess if you live in Japan, eat a CRISPR edited crop. And then this one is a little bit, it's not exactly an edited crop, but it is a food that involves CRISPR. Um, so there's a, a beer that's made in Berkeley, inventively named CRISPR. Um, where instead of adding hops to the beer in the, the process of making the beer, they instead engineered the yeast to make a compound that gives the hoppy flavor. So they've eliminated an entire ingredient in the beer and given it, and it still tastes, I mean, to me, I've had it, it tastes like beer. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about perhaps why there aren't more um, crops or, or products yet available, and why I think people might be interested in using CRISPR and other genome editing tools that I didn't really talk about instead of using GM technology, and that is regulation. So regulation has been um, very restrictive for, in some cases, in the case of GMOs, but it's not as restrictive in, for CRISPR, which I'll get into. So, 
basically, how are these regulated? With these older forms of breeding, there are not added regulations based on the technique used. With GMOs, they're strictly, strictly regulated, and there's a lot of requirements that an academic or a company would have to go through in order to actually get their crop approved with their product approved. But with CRISPR, it's variable. And I say that because in the US, they've decided to basically put it in the same category as these products um, and not consider it to be a GMO. Whereas in the EU and other places, it's a different story. So I think I have a little, yeah. So in the US, um, basically CRISPR is not gonna have additional regulations. In the EU, it does. It's regulated the same as a GMO. There's been some discussion that maybe this will soften recently, and I know the UK, as it leaves the EU, is probably going to side on the US stance with this, um, but it's not totally clear. So I really recommend if this is of interest to you, since it's very different country to country, and I didn't mention most of the world, um, there's a really nice policy tracker that the Genetic Literacy Project is, has put together that I checked before I came here just to make sure I was up to date, um, and it's really useful and tells you all the regulatory stuff you might want to know. And so a point that I want to make about why this matters is that right now, only a handful of companies really can afford to make these GM crops. Like they have to go for these blockbuster mainstream crops in order to get money back on the investment of doing all the R&D and regulatory hurdles that they have to go through. Um, and whereas CRISPR is much more precise, it's cheaper, and there's a lower regulatory burden, at least in the US. And so to me, this means there's an opportunity um, for smaller companies, academics, and others to get into this market and diversify it a little bit. Like, I don't think we benefit from having a very small number of companies able to control all of the, the newer breeding technologies. So I think with CRISPR, we have a chance for people to you know, maybe make small startups in Hawaii and in places where um, there are these tropical crops that are not going to be of interest likely to the giant agribusinesses um, and develop a, a really niche, not that niche, but more niche product um, that could be really useful locally. And so I'll close by just saying that, you know, CRISPR is one tool in the toolbox. It is not a magic bullet that can fix everything, um, but it is one uh, very useful approach for, for certain applications. And with that, I'll, I'll thank the, the IGI, my home institution, until a couple of months ago. If you want to learn more about CRISPR, they have tons of resources, and a lot of stuff that I developed is getting released very soon, um, which is just like basic explainers on a lot of this uh, technology and applications. And I'll just very briefly plug my current um, employee, employer, Arcadia Science uh, in Berkeley. We're trying to work on basically all the diversity of life that isn't usually studied in the lab, uh, taking advantage of approaches like CRISPR that let us do advanced uh, manipulation and, and new sequencing approaches, all kinds of different things. So we're working on like, uh, you know, these little organisms that can insist when there's no water around and survive really harsh conditions and then come back and live again. Um, protists, diatoms, ticks, all sorts of things. So it's really fun, um, and I'm happy to talk to you about it more later individually if you're interested. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions if we have a minute or two. Yeah, thank you.